So this is the Gospel of Mark, Mark for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number four, and the title of this lesson is uh, Jesus, Lord of All. And if you're following along in your Bibles, I'll throw the scriptures up on the screen, but uh, you can open them to Mark chapter four. So let me just review a little bit what we've been doing so far. In our study, we've seen that Jesus has begun uh, to demonstrate His divine abilities and His divine person through His teaching and through His miracles. That's what Mark has been telling us for four chapters. And the reaction to Him is very strong but mixed. So everyone is amazed at both His deeds and His words, but some are skeptical and confrontational with the Lord. So uh, last week we looked at a series of seven instances where he was accused of all kinds of sins, even insanity by the Jewish leaders that thought he was crazy. And uh, even his family came to get him and kind of bring him home for a rest. Uh, and his response to these always confirmed that what he did, he did because of who he was and exactly according to God's word. So after these confrontations, you know, these seven confrontations we looked at, uh, last time, we see Jesus continue to teach, but now He's going to be teaching using parables. Uh, and He's using parables in order to create less turmoil, because the things that He's saying, the things that He's doing, stirring up the people, so on and so forth, He's still got a ways to go to you know, complete the task that He has. He can't be always in the middle of a riot, so He begins teaching in, in parables. And in this way, the believers and the disciples they continued to be taught, but the suspicion of the Jewish leaders was not aroused. And so that's one of the reasons he used the parables. Okay, so the next section, we're going to contrast what has just taken place. In the seven previous encounters, there was skepticism, there was disbelief, there were even accusations and confrontation. In the next section that we're going to look at tonight, Jesus encounters four situations or groups of people who witness His power, but they believe. And that's what Mark is doing. He's contrasting those who didn't believe, those who were confronting, with now people who actually believe the message. Okay? So for these people, Jesus is not only a great teacher and miracle worker, He's also the Lord of all situations. All right? So let's take a look at chapter four, beginning in verse 35. Now when I say the Lord of all situations, I mean that in different ways, Mark is going to show Jesus' lordship over various areas of life that had complete power over ordinary people, but not power over Jesus. Okay, so first example, we see Jesus demonstrating the fact that He's the Lord of nature. Chapter four, beginning in verse 35 says, on that day when evening came, He said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So after a series of teachings and miracle healings, Jesus sets uh, you know, to cross the lake of Galilee. And he falls asleep in the cushion on the boat. He's tired from his work, obviously. You know, we forget, you know, he's the son of God, but he's still within a human body, and so he's had a pretty, pretty difficult day. So a storm uh, comes up that threatens to sink the boat. Now, it must have been a fierce storm because they were afraid, and most of them were fishermen. So they weren't like, you know, not used to being in waves and storms. So it really was a threatening storm. Now, they don't wake him up right away, and then they don't wake him up to ask him for help, they wake him up because he's sleeping through it all and they think they're about to die. So they figure, you know, maybe we ought to wake him up you know, before we die. So upon awakening, he calms the sea with only a word. He rebukes them for being afraid and having no faith. And their response was they were awestruck. You know, today we use the word awesome. Wow, that's awesome pizza. You know. 
this is awesome, that someone says to the, to the wind, be still, that someone says to the waves, be calm, and, and, and they obey his command. Now that's awesome. So they were awestruck. You know, they had no power over the storm. They were completely at the mercy of the storm. And Jesus shows by this miracle that he had authority over the natural elements. So with one story, well not a story, but recounting the events, Mark demonstrates now that Jesus has power over the natural phenomenon, wind, rain, uh, storm. So who, who, who is the only person that has uh, power over nature? Well, only God controls nature. And remember, he didn't predict that it would rain. It wasn't a prediction of rain. It wasn't a weather report. And he didn't explain what was going on. He actually controlled it at his will. And so with this episode, Mark kind of puts before his readers the fact that Jesus is Lord over nature. Okay, episode two. Demonstrates that Jesus now is Lord over the spirit world. No use paraphrasing. The story is right there. We might as well read it. It says, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes, and when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, and they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him, and he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. First they were awestruck, notice, they were amazed. So immediately after this, the story tells us, they reach the other side, they're confronted by a man possessed by an unclean spirit. Now Jesus had done this before, he had cast out spirits before. But some were unimpressed because there were demon possession cases that were handled by the priests at that time. The priests also uh, were dealing with these things. So when Jesus did it, it, wasn't, you know, it was like, okay, we've seen this before, you can do this too. This time, however, Mark describes a man possessed by many demon, legion, many demons, um, and who could not be cured by anyone or restrained by anyone. That's why he gives a big description of this person here. No one could handle this guy. Again, Jesus uh, cures him with simply a word and the demons are cast out. Now, this particular healing had some interesting features. First of all, he has dialogue with the demons, something that doesn't uh, normally happen. And probably to demonstrate to the man and his disciples that he knew what the problem was and yet was still without fear. Uh, also, Jesus sends the demons into a nearby herd of swine, uh, probably an area here where there were Gentiles because there were no herds of swine among the, among the Jews, of course. 
Some people think that he did this to reassure the man that the demons were truly out of him and they were physically somewhere else. So Jesus dealing also with uh, the issue of faith in this man. And then the destruction of the swine, some people often question that, but you know, is not a man's life worth more than a herd of pigs? You know, let's face it. So the people of the town, they're angry, they're frightened, they didn't ask for a remuneration for the pigs, they just wanted Jesus to leave them alone. Again, they couldn't get past the destruction of the animals to see what had really happened. Okay. So the man is completely sane, dressed, at peace after uh, years of insanity and torment. And then Jesus leaves the man um, and the man wants to come with him. He, you know, hey, I, let me follow you. So Jesus said, no, go back to where you come from, Decapolis, meaning the 10 cities, Deca, 10. Go back to the region where you come from and tell them, publish the news, tell them what has happened. I want to make a little parenthetical statement here, something that we don't do a lot. A lot of times we're sharing with someone and we immediately want to teach them the Bible. You have a Bible? Open your Bible. Let me show you. you know, let me explain to you what baptism is. Or let me do this. You know. The most powerful thing to begin with, I always encourage people, is your own personal witness. And you know, in the Church of Christ, sometimes we don't, we don't think about that. You know, we, 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 we don't, that's not our go-to position. And yet our personal witness is the most powerful teaching tool that we have. You know, not all of us uh, are able to you know, teach. You know, maybe that's not our, in our skill set. We might know the material. We might understand the Bible. But you know, transferring that information to someone else may not be easy for us but telling our own story, and our own story is always true. It's always relevant, even if it happened 30 years ago. It's always relevant to you because it's something that happened to you. And so this is what Jesus does with this person. He didn't know anything about John the Baptist. He didn't know anything about, there's nothing in here about the Messiah, that Jesus was the Messiah, nothing. He just said, go home and tell your people what happened to you. And we'll, we're, we'll you know, we'll, we'll see that later on. So uh, we'll see the result of that later on. So Jesus leaves and the man uh, you know, goes his way to the 10 cities. And a uh, little later on, Jesus is going to come back to this area and he will do great miracles and he'll have great success, largely due to the fact that the man went back to his area and told people what happened. So when Jesus came back another time in that area, there were tremendous crowds. That, uh, that greeted him. So Jesus, after demonstrating that he had power over the natural world, shows that he also has power over the spiritual world. He overcomes nature in the outside world. He overcomes the demons in the inside world. So the reader is left with the conclusion, again, that only God has power over the, deacon, uh, over the deacons, yeah, I wish, uh, over the demons. <laughs> <laughs> Only God has power over the demons and uh, he, he, he doesn't say it, right? He just lets you make that conclusion for yourself. Okay, so Lord over nature, Lord over spirits, third episode. Lord of illness, Lord of illness. I'm not going to read this section, just uh, I think we're familiar with it. Mark intertwines here two stories, each of them showing Jesus' concern and his power over illness. At first, Jesus is confronted by a synagogue official, today it'd be a minister, uh, whose daughter is ill to the point of death. He begs Jesus to come and uh, heal her, and Jesus agrees. But on his way, he's interrupted by a woman who secretly touches his cloak with the point of being healed from her own disease. We find out that she has an issue of blood, a hemorrhaging, constant he hemorrhaging. And so the crowd was pressing on him and she reached through to touch his coat. She was immediately cured. Um, she suffered from uterine bleeding, which did not stop. Her condition had bankrupted her with the doctors and also did not permit her to attend services at the temple because you know, uh, at that time um, among the Jews, uh, during a period of menstruation, a woman was considered, quote, unclean. So she had to wait a certain number of days and go through a certain uh, purification ritual before 
joining again the public assembly. But this woman, because of her hemorrhage, was never clean. She was always considered unclean. And so it wasn't just the physical suffering, but it was the social suffering. She could not fellowship. She could not, she was cut off away, cut off from a, a very a major part of the uh, uh, lifestyle of that, uh, of that culture. So the woman is immediately healed, but Jesus forces her to acknowledge her illness and what she had done and the results. And the reason was to publicly declare the miracle and also to verify that she was now healed and could return to worship in the temple. If, if she would have just stolen away, there'd be no public record of what had taken place. So Jesus forces her to do that. Now, a disease that had been treated for years that was not mental or spiritual in nature, it wasn't demon possession, that was uniquely female in nature, Jesus heals without saying a single word. You know, I watch sometimes Faith Healers and the big show on TV and so on and so forth. Lots of words, lots of action, lots of music, lots of drama here. He doesn't even say a word. She just touches him and uh, she is healed. So Jesus is not only Lord over illness, but His Lordship is expressed by His mere presence. Okay, so third, Lord of illness. Fourth, Lord over death. Lord over death. It says, while He was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue officials saying, your daughter has died, why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what had been spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk for she was 12 years old and immediately they were completely astounded and he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this and he said that something should be given her to eat. So Mark continues the narrative with the story of the synagogue leader's daughter. A report comes that she has died and the father gives up hope. He's ready to accept the fact that you know, his daughter was dead and Jesus offers him hope telling him only to believe and not to be afraid. So when he arrives, the professional mourners are there, and uh, as well as a crowd of people who laugh as he announces. You know, the interesting thing there is that he gives even those people a chance to believe. You know, he could just walk by and say, you know, you, you, could you move over please? You know, I'm here, but he, he gives them a chance. She's not dead, she's just asleep. They knew who he was, he was no stranger. He was probably the most well-known person of that era in that community. He gives them a chance to believe and they don't. So the only people who witness the miracles are the ones who believe. So he brings his companions, the mother and the father, everyone else is, everyone else is put, uh, put out. So again, Mark demonstrates Jesus' lordship over another impossible enemy of man and that's death itself, because you know, all these things he's lord over that, ma that Mark selects to uh, recount are all things that man has absolutely no power over. You know, if it was a political thing that Jesus did or a military thing that Jesus did or a construction thing that Jesus did, well, man had some sort of power over those type of things. But you know, nature, demons, illness, death, you know, uh, no, we, we have no we have no power over those things, 100%. So the four episodes establish Jesus as one with divine power to overcome these things over which man has traditionally had little or no control, nature, the spirit world, illness, and death. And so the conclusion is left uh, that's given to the reader is that only God can have and demonstrate this kind of power. Therefore, you, know, you got to make it up in your own mind. Therefore, Jesus, you know, if God, you know, A, if only God controls these things, Jesus controls these things. Therefore, well, then Jesus must be God, right? Okay. 
All right, so now in chapter six, Mark you know, begins to describe the expansion of Jesus' ministry. So up, up until this time, he's describing you know, incidents, isolated incidents, Jesus' preaching, his miracles, various reactions to that. With time, his ministry expands, and Mark describes this evolution as well as more reactions to Jesus' increasing fame. So now, he talks about Jesus' hometown, how, how, how the ministry now is beginning to grow. Again, we're not going to read these here, I think you're familiar with them. The news and fame of his teaching and miracles reach his hometown before he does. He's been in the big city doing these things. So they're hearing about it back home. Their response, skepticism. And their skepticism is so provincial. I mean, their thinking is, how can somebody from this place do these kind of things? Maybe somebody from Jerusalem might do, but you know, from our little town? They even mention Jesus as the hometown carpenter's son and one of many in a local family. Jesus this time is the one who is amazed. You know, notice he always said the people were amazed, the people were in awe. Here it says, Mark says, Jesus was amazed. And what was he amazed at? Well, in the New Testament, Jesus is only amazed at two things. Great faith, lack of faith. <laughs> the centurion, he was amazed at the faith of the centurion, you know, who says, you don't have to come to my house, just, just say the word. And you know, you remember that story? And it says Jesus was amazed at this centurion's faith. You know, and he says it. You know, I've not found faith like this anywhere in Israel. And people were not happy about that. And then here, he's amazed here. What is he amazed at? Well, he's amazed at their lack of faith after everything that he's, uh, uh, he's done. So Jesus this time is the one who's amazed, but he continues to teach nevertheless in the synagogue. He was sent to preach the good news and he does this without the accompanying miracles in his hometown. Another example of his expanded ministry, he sends out the 12. All right, verses seven to 13. Again, not going to read that. So time is moving on. He can only be in one place at a time. So he sends out his apostles to kind of replicate his ministry, gives them the ability to do miracles, gives them the charge to preach, gives them instructions about their conduct and their ministry. He says to them, he will provide for them, don't bring extra stuff, I will take care of everything you need. He tells them to stay in one place. When they receive you, he said, stay in one place. No begging from door to door, that's the idea. No going from door to door begging for food and money. When they receive you in one place, you stay there. If they don't receive you, shake off the dust, leave town, go to the next place. So uh, this is an important phase of training uh, for the future of their work that begins, uh, that Mark describes here. Um, another example, uh, Jesus and Herod. Very interesting relationship of these two. At this point, even though the people in Nazareth don't think this is a big deal, the people in Jerusalem, you know, they're the ones that are amazed. So at this point, Jesus' fame reaches the top ruler in the area and uh, we get some background information about Herod. Uh, one of the few times that um, uh, he does this in his uh, gospel. So Herod and his sons had gained power in the area through political collusion with Rome. They bought it. Scheming, you know, he wasn't like a real king. You know, they, he, was, uh, he bought his position. Now the Herod that Mark is talking about here was the son of the Herod who had killed the children in Bethlehem during Jesus' infancy. Uh, he, had, he had abandoned his wife and had eloped with Herodias, his brother's wife, uh, who was, of course, she was already married at the time. Uh, so he went to Rome, saw her, uh, eloped with her, came back with her. Okay. And, um, and he was also her half uncle, I don't know how that works, but it's, it's pretty gamey, okay? So uh, today we say it's so wrong. It was, so this was so wrong. You know, it was wrong in every way possible. That's why you know, when John the Baptist was saying, you can't have her, you know, your brother's wife, you can't have her, uh, they, they understood. So John the Baptist denounced this union, and in so doing, he threatens Herodias' position as queen. 
Now Herod knew Jewish law and custom and he understood John's preaching and John's meaning. So during a supper given in honor of his nobleman, Herod is tricked into promising Herod's daughter uh, or Herodias' daughter uh, a special favor. Again, a familiar story. She, manipulated by her mother, demands John the Baptist's execution and in order not to lose face, we, we know that Herod has John the Baptist killed. So th since this time, it seems that Herod has been consumed by guilt and anxiety. So when Jesus appears, okay, Herod begins to believe that Jesus is the incarnation of John, a righteous man that he's killed. And this, you know, this, this, this appearance now, he's come to, to, uh, to haunt him, all right, superstitious man. So Mark uses this kind of flashback device to introduce an important character of that era and also to describe the circumstances that brought to an end the ministry of John the Baptist, who was an important character introduced earlier in his book. I remember I told you at the beginning, Mark, you know, just give us the facts. It's like a postcard, you know, it's like a snapshot, boom, boom, he doesn't waste a lot of time. So with this one story, he covers John the Baptist, why he's not there, why there is now this problem with Herod, okay. Um, another thing, Jesus and his disciples. Uh, Matthew and John record long passages where Jesus is actually teaching his apostles. There's a lot of dialogue, a lot of questions, answers between them, that's in Matthew and John. Mark doesn't give long passages of sermons and exhortations, that's not him. He shows us Jesus teaching them by doing, by giving examples, by sending them out to do stuff and receiving their response. So we have examples of this from uh, verses 30 to uh, 56, some of the th uh, interaction between Jesus and His disciples, the ones that Mark mentions. Uh, first of all, there's the retreat in verses uh, uh, 30 to 32. Uh, they go out, they preach, they come back. Jesus tries to bring them away on a retreat, if you wish, to rest, refresh themselves. Uh, we do see, however, that they report everything that they did. So they begin with a retreat. Then there's the rally, okay? What begins as a retreat ends as a rally as thousands gather together to hear Jesus. Listen, if you've got no doctor, if you've got no medicine, if you're dirt poor and you're sick and all of a sudden this person shows up and he's healing people and you hear that he's over here, I mean, you're going to be looking for that person. Exactly what happens. So Jesus' miracles and teachings and the recent preaching tour of the apostles has kind of stirred up the population to come and hear Jesus for themselves. Remember, the apostles aren't preaching themselves, they're talking about Jesus. So the people are motivated to see Him. So He is confined because of time and distance and because now Herod is stalking Him. So, so what's happening now is that instead of Him going to the crowds, now the crowds are coming to Him. Okay. So in this sense, we see Jesus feed the people in two ways. He feeds them spiritual food in a natural way by preaching, and then He feeds them physical food in a supernatural way by the miracle of the fish and the bread. So Jesus is giving His apostles an illustration of several important lessons here. First of all, humans have both physical and spiritual needs that they must satisfy as ministers. You know, it's not all preaching and teaching. You know, if you're a minister, there's a lot of you know, close, what we call close in work, close in work, counseling, encouragement, hospital visits, just you know, that type of thing. And also Jesus is showing them that He can fulfill both needs. With Him, there's always more than enough. Without Him, there was only five loaves and two fish. With Him, enough food to feed 5,000 people. A great lesson, a great lesson. You know, when we ourselves are beginning to doubt that we, we don't have the resources, emotional, physical, whatever, to do what we need to do. We need to kind of think about that. So they've just ministered, done, they've done miracles, and he reminds them that he's the source of these things, not they themselves. Then there's the walking on the water episode, 45 to 52, again, I'm not going to read it, demonstrates that they were slow learners, we know the story sends them across the lake by themselves this time. Last time he was in the boat with them. They're having problems again with the storm and the boat. And what did they do? They didn't call on First time he's in the boat, they still don't call on him for help. 
Now he's not in the boat, they hit a storm, they still don't call on him, you know, slow learners. When they see him walking on water, they're afraid. I mean, they've just seen him cast demons out. He's just <laughs> converted a couple of pieces of bread and fish for enough food to feed 5,000 people. He's healed people. He's raised people from the dead. And when they see him walking on water, this freaks them out. So they're, they're, they're slow, they're slow. <laughs> so here they've witnessed miracles. They have themselves performed miracles. They've seen him exercise power over every natural and spiritual enemy. They've heard his teaching, but they still didn't understand the conclusion that this was pointing to. Not that he was a man who did miracles, but that he was the divine son of God. So with him, everything was possible. So each one of these miracles and signs, however, were bringing them closer and closer and closer to uh, realization. And then another episode of miracles. You notice what I'm doing here. I'm not, I'm not just choosing random things. You know, I'm starting in chapter four and we're just working our way verse by verse um, through the chapters, reading some, paraphrase, paraphrasing others. So more miracles. When they reach the other side of the lake, Mark describes uh, almost in an offhand manner the many more miracles Jesus continued to do, even doing them without speaking. It's like an afterthought. Yeah, they went across and then you know, more miracles. And more, just another day at the office, more miracles. So just his presence now produces great healings. So the apostles gain uh, interesting um, uh, this great display of power and slowly they're becoming, you know, they're coming around to the idea of who Jesus, who Jesus really was. Okay, so this will mark the beginning of the final time that Jesus will perform public miracles. In the next two chapters, there's going to be more confrontation and several other key miracles, but from here on in, he's going to begin to prepare his disciples to understand two great truths. Truth number one, his true identity. You know, all of these miracles, all of these teachings, all of this stuff is not there in a vacuum for itself. It's there to point to something. As a matter of fact, that's what miracles are, aren't they? Miracles are, 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 are phenomena that point to something. So the miracles point to him as the Son of God, as the Messiah, although Mark doesn't focus so much on the idea of him being the Messiah as Matthew does, because Matthew's writing for Jews. So for Jews, it was important that he, you know, that he, was, that he, he um, proved that he was the Messiah from scripture. Mark has a, on a, a different agenda, a different, uh, you know, a different uh, type of people reading his thing. So he's less concerned about him being the Messiah but more concerned about understanding the divine nature that he has. And then the second reality uh, or truth that they need to understand is the true mission. The mission wasn't miracles. The mission was the cross. And he's pointing them to that, the cross is coming. And you know, they need to understand he's the son of God so that they can grasp the idea that he can resurrect. Because he's also going to talk about, you know, they'll kill me, but I will resurrect. If he is the son of God, then that is not out of his reach, right? So those who claim you know, to be faith healers today, they, they forget the original purpose of miracles. Uh, to witness to the divinity of Christ. That, that was one of the original reasons for miracles. To witness to the divinity of Christ and also to witness to the truth of his word. The apostles were preaching and they were saying, this is the truth, we saw it with our own eyes. The, you know, the resurrection, so on and so forth. And people would say, why should we believe you? And then the apostles would heal someone or raise someone from the dead or do a miracle and, and that would be the answer. That's why you should believe me because you know, uh, God has given me the power uh, to do things that men uh, cannot normally do. Today, obviously, we don't, I don't need to witness a miracle to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I've, I've got this here, this is, this is my proof, this is my text, the miracles in here, eyewitnessed by the apostles, okay? So um, uh, this is why uh, Jesus and the early uh, disciples uh, did the miracles. All right, today we don't have miracles, but I, I just want to say one thing here before we finish. We have a thing called providence. 
the providence of God. And a lot of times we underestimate what providence is. We just think, oh, providence, God is being nice to us, or you know, oh, dear Lord, you know, help me find a parking spot. You know, oh, the providence of God, a parking spot. The providence of God is God working in your life. So if I pray, if I've got cancer and I pray, Lord, please, if it be your will, you know, put me into remission, help me you know, overcome this disease, blah, blah, and I get better. That's not a miracle, that's the providence of God working, the answer uh, to a prayer. God is powerful, obviously, and He works in powerful ways in our lives. A miracle is I, I, I fall on a train track and the train goes over my arm and I don't have my arm anymore, and then somebody says, oh, watch what I can do. In the name of Jesus, you know, he puts his hand on my shoulder and a new arm comes out. Oh, okay, that's a miracle, okay. But that I had migraine headaches for 10 years and I prayed, Lord, please, you know, please help me to find relief from these things. And somehow through finding the right medicine, uh, more exercise, whatever, a change of attitude or just God took them away from me. That's not a miracle, that's, that's the providence of God. God working within the rules and using rules we don't even know about to help us, those aren't miracles. It's when, it's when God goes against the rules, okay? Someone who is dead, dead, dead for three days you know, and stinking like Lazarus and rotting and then God, Jesus comes along and brings him back to life, that's a miracle. It goes against all the rules, okay? All right, so that's uh, Mark. That's where we're at in Mark. We're going to continue chapter seven, read on. Our goal, hopefully, is when we're done, you will know the book of Mark, and you will know what it's about, some of the key ideas in it. All right, thank you very much.